and welcome into episode 23 of the Orlando Drummer Podcast. I'm glad you guys are here, and we got a fun one today. Uh, I'm doing a solo episode here. Chris is off for the week, so we're going to be doing some Q&A, but these are some fantastic questions. I've actually saved some of these questions over the last several weeks specifically for this episode. And start off with a little teacher rant for you. You know, I don't know where that phrase came from, that there are no dumb questions but I have never bought that ever. There are definitely some really bad questions out there, questions that I, I mean, I've gotten a lot of them over the years for sure, but questions that you can answer yourself normally go in that category, questions that have obvious answers or questions that imply that you haven't thought about this very much before asking this question. Those sort of questions, um, I either don't answer or I just try to avoid them all together. You know, I'm one of those teachers who likes to make people work for the solution because I think when you earn knowledge and earn wisdom, it's that much more valuable as opposed to just handing somebody the answers, so to speak. Um, but in the case of these questions today, I think I have five of them. Man, these are the cream of the crop. These are really well thought out, well articulated questions that are going to lead us down some really fun um, technological, philosophical, musical wormholes. We got a lot of things we can explore throughout this uh, throughout this uh, episode. By the way, all of these questions today are from from OrlandoDrummer.com, either from the forums or they were commented on videos there. For those of you guys that don't know, here's the brief and only plug you'll ever get on this podcast. Uh, OrlandoDrummer.com is an online education platform. It's an online drum school, and it's very much in the style of Netflix. So there are hundreds and hundreds of videos, drumless loops, podcasts like this one, interviews with pro drummers master classes, um, audio and video lesson packs. I mean, tons of different courses. Everything I did in my entire 20s is there. It's about 160 to 175 hours worth of content. The best way to think about that is like if you went to Guitar Center and you bought 50 drum DVDs, that's about how much content you're accessing for under $1 a day on OrlandoDrummer.com. And you can try it for free uh, for seven days before you have to pay anything at all. And it gives you full access to everything on the site. You can use code ODPC. Orlando Drummer Podcast. Uh, use code ODPC, saves you 25% on your first two months. And that's where all of these questions came from. There's a really big community forum there, um, which is really nice for sort of long format discussions. It's a hell of a lot better than a YouTube or Instagram comment section, that's for sure. So with all that said, let's get into our first question. This one is from Samuel. He's a member of OrlandoDrummer.com for the last six, seven months or so. So Samuel asks, do you think music is evolving or devolving? On one end of the spectrum, you have bands such as Animals as Leaders and Pliny who really stretch music as a whole. However, at the same time, take a look at mainstream music. I don't think I need to explain the difference. So let me first start off by saying I completely empathize with where you're coming from here, Samuel. It, there's, a, there's a stark contrast between, I don't know, a, a Taylor Swift song and a Pliny song. I, I get it. And if, if we were measuring what is good or not good about any particular piece of music by technical ability, well, animal, Animals as Leaders and Pliny and all of those bands, anything in that direction wins every time, every single time. But... You have to remember that there are there's different asks for different genres of music. So, for example, like pop music is very easy to perform. It can be very demanding at the same time. But let's just say on a technical level, that's not really what's difficult about pop music. Um, if you were to go to Animals as Leaders, the technical difficulty is super, super high. But if I sent you into the studio and I said... I want you to write a technically difficult song. Well, that's one challenge, right? That's that's very difficult to do. You could spend a lot of time working out the math, practicing the parts, and it's a high level of technical musicianship, for sure. But if I also sent you into the same studio and said, hey, don't worry about it being technical, I just want you to write a song that 10 million people will all agree is good. That is a very different and Equally, if not more difficult, challenge, right? Because pop music, by definition, is supposed to be popular. And creating any piece of art, whether it's a painting or a sculpture or a song, that everyone, when I say everyone, I mean like a majority of mainstream culture, most of the population, will say is good, that's extremely hard to do. You could also argue that, that you know, writing technically difficult music that a niche genre of or a niche fan base would only enjoy that something about that is also easier right because you're catering to this smaller market and it's kind of predictable what they actually like when you get into pop music you know I assume that's what you're talking about when you say the, the de-evolution of music 
Um, it, it's it's tricky. It's a lot more nuanced than that. So when I hear an Ariana Grande song, a Taylor Swift song, a Katy Perry song, you know, name your your modern pop artists, not necessarily all female, but anything in in that realm, I try to think, you know, this is an accomplishment, not not that you would measure by technical ability, just by the fact that this gets stuck in your head and it gets stuck in everyone else's head too. Like to hack into somebody's like neurology that way, um, whether it's by writing a really good melody or something that we would consider, you know, timeless, like an eternal, like a Michael Jackson song or a Stevie Wonder song or a Prince song, like to permeate culture to that degree is a totally different task altogether. Now, admittedly, Animals as leaders and plain eager examples, that's not their goal. They're, they're not trying to write pop music that appeals to everyone. I'm sure they would all willingly admit that it's a specialized genre of music. Um, so to answer your question, it's not an evolution or a de-evolution necessarily. It, it, it's, it's dystopian and utopian at the same time. It's a little bit of everything in all directions. It's all the chaos and all the order at the same time. So it's very messy and it's definitely not not that simple. Now, I do want to give you some credit here. There is definitely, there are some directions that pop music has taken. Pop country is another one, Christian contemporary music, like the real forefront of, of pop um, and even hip hop as well, where you know, we all kind of look around as musicians and go like, where are we going here? Like what, like, you know, country, even back to like 15, 20 years ago, there's some highly questionable topics. Like, I don't know, um, honky tonk, but donk donk. There's a good example. Like, what are we doing here? Like, you know, um, you could go all the way to like modern mumble rap where you, you literally cannot understand the words that are being said in the music. Like there's definitely some directions um, where more popular genres of music have gone that don't seem to make any sense. But what I find that, that well, I try to think about this a lot, that culture tends to be cyclical in a lot of ways. So it's a matter of time before what's cool right now is no longer cool. It goes out of style. And then after a certain period of time, that thing, that genre of music or that clothing style, whatever cultural thing it is, after it wasn't cool for a long time, it becomes cool again. And so a really good example of this in pop music would be uh, Dua Lipa, who's had four or five hits this year uh, that charted very, very high. And she's definitely a pop artist, but you can hear this this like ABBA, almost James Brown, like disco funk influence in all of the music. And, you know, Bruno Mars sort of started doing this as well, where like uh, they have this Motown or Sweet Soul kind of feeling. And all of a sudden there's like this nostalgic element to the music, um, but it is by all means a new, relevant, modern pop song. But it's got a lot of flavor from like 40, 50 years ago that all of a sudden is cool again. So I like seeing those kind of things emerge. Um, you can see this with Lady Gaga and Madonna, right? Like there's a lot of influence that happens, but there needs to be a long enough span of time uh, between that original creation and then when it becomes like nostalgia cool again. There's got to be enough time in between those two for that to happen. But I think we're we're entering that sort of era where you know, sounds from the 60s, 70s, and 80s are appearing more in pop music now. But again, this is just, it's, it just depends on the specific artist and the specific song, right? But I would say as a whole, try to avoid thinking of the music industry, which is way too big to make any definitive statement about, but try thinking about the entire thing as though it's really complicated. So we could find one specific subgenre or a band that has like, devolved, you know, to, to be honest, I'm going to go ahead and give you an example of that one, a band that I think has devolved. Um, I'm going to say Maroon 5. You know, you go back to songs about Jane, which was a, a rock album in the late 90s, early 2000s, maybe. Fantastic cover to cover. I mean, like hit after hit after hit after hit. And somewhere around when they released like Payphone and Moves Like Jagger, like all of a sudden all the instruments disappeared. So it's like... They're not a band anymore. I haven't heard a, a <laughs> I haven't heard a, a guitar, a snare drum, a, a actual bass, or real keyboards in a Maroon Five song in a very very long time. It's like fully produced hip hop backing tracks over Adam Levine singing, and the the quality of the lyrics and the the topics themselves have devolved into less interesting, less personal, less meaningful topics like. So the de-evolution you're describing is definitely valid. I see it with that specific band for sure. Um, 
you know, it, it really just depends. And so, and then to kind of contrast this, when you say music is evolving, I, I think there's no other thing that can happen to music. I think it constantly evolves. I think it's just part of what music is. It's evolved from the first note that was ever played, from the first rhythm that was ever conceptualized. As a human race, we began building on that. So I don't think there's any way that you can uh, not evolve music. If you're participating in the activity of performing and playing and learning music, then you are contributing to the evolution of it. So I think uh, in that way, we're, we're always evolving. That will never, never stop. Great question though, man. A lot of ways we could, directions you could go with a question like that. Um, but those are some of my thoughts about it. But really good question, Sam. Thanks a lot. Next question is actually an anonymous one. This guy asked to stay anonymous um, and you'll see why here. So he says, Hey, Adam, love your podcast, your website, and everything you put out. I work at Sam Ash Music Store, and we watch your videos all the time. And that actually makes me happy because I remember sitting, I used to work at Sam Ash about 10, 12 years ago now. It was a long time ago. And um, I remember, I remember watching DVDs, like tons, all, we had all the drum DVDs there. So we would watch all of them uh, in the drum department of Sam Ash. I learned a ton from just sitting around all day watching, uh, watching DVDs. And we didn't have YouTube on the computer system at the time, but I'm sure they do now in like a modern music store. So that's really cool to think people are watching any of my content inside of a, a Sam Ash or Guitar Center somewhere. So that's really cool. Um, he says, I'm not sure if you've been to a Sam Ash or a Guitar Center recently, but many of them have been shutting down. We don't carry the quantity or quality of inventory that we used to. And while I don't have access to all of the sales figures, I have no doubt that the company, or at the very least my own store, is in pretty rough shape. My question is, what is the future of retail music stores? Do you see any surviving? Will there be any music stores or drum shops in 5, 10, or 20 plus years into the future? This is a brutal question. It's a really brutal one. And I've put a fair amount of thought into this question before because at least he worked at Sam Ash, is that right? Uh, Sam Ash is where, where this guy works. And man, it... I've been into a, a Sam Ash recently um, and a Guitar Center recently, like within the last two to three months. And I'd say I make my way to a Guitar Center or a Sam Ash anywhere from like, I don't know, four to ten times a year. Like if I, you know, little quick things that I need. And man, I, I have seen that progression you're talking about, like the the well regression would be a better word like it they're they're consistently in rougher and rougher shape let's specifically talk about guitar center for a minute though because guitar center has been bailed out i believe they're on time number 6 or number 7 somebody in the comments can correct me on that um uh, but what they have is like an angel investor somebody that comes in with a huge amount of money and says your debt to income ratio is so bad that you just need like a cash infusion. We're just gonna give you like several million dollars and try and fix everything. So that has happened over and over and over and over and it has always failed. Guitar Center finds themselves in a really, really rough financial position over and over. And you have to imagine that that the internet is the number one thing that has caused a lot of their struggles, right? I mean, online education, first of all, is a huge, huge part of that. It has definitely taken away from their ability to have lessons. I don't know anyone who takes lessons at a guitar center. I don't even know if Guitar Center still offers that necessarily anymore, but obviously you're in direct competition with sites like OrlandoDrummer.com and all of the other online education sites that are out there. So a lot of those like extra forms of income that, that they might have had, I'm sure a lot of those have really been uh, been affected for sure. Now that's just speaking about my world. When we go into retail, dude, I don't know. I don't know how Guitar Center, Sam Ash, um, or or any any type of music retail store. I don't know how they're going to compete with Sweetwater Musicians Friend, Reverb. Long term, I do not see them surviving. I just don't. But that is not at all me picking on Guitar Center or Sam Ash as individual companies. Because this happens to all sorts of industries. And I want you to think back 10 years ago or 15 years ago, uh, early internet days, which is weird to say, but um, you know, think about when things began going online. Uh, that one of the first big things was Amazon was selling books, right? You could get books online. You could get the ebook. I remember that was a hot word for a few years before it became totally normal. 
Uh, but the idea that you would order a book online instead of going to a Borders or a Books a Million or a Barnes and Noble or your local bookstore or a library, right? You know, people used to think that if you can't touch the pages and you can't feel the paper and you can't get a coffee and go crack the book open and really see what it's all about, you know, if you can't do that, you know, very few people are going to order books online. It's really just going to be like a niche market. And then they were proven completely wrong. Turns out like 99% of people really don't care about going to the bookstore. They would rather just get the book that they want and have someone bring it to their front door for the same amount of money, if not even less money, right? Despite people saying that the book industry, uh, the in-person like book retail, that that would never be affected, it definitely was. And in a couple of years, all of them started shutting down. I can't remember the last time I saw a an open Borders or Barnes and Noble or Books a Million, like all of them shut down. They're all gone. And you can do do this industry by industry by industry. Uh, so another good example is mattresses. You, know, you say, well, who's going to buy a mattress they can't sleep on? Who's ever going to do that? Thinking back 10 years ago, I definitely would have said that, right? The internet can't really compete with that because you got to go lay on the mattress. But then two-hour YouTube reviews start coming out of every mattress that's ever existed. So you can get an in-depth, detailed breakdown of like every mattress that's on the market. There's full comparison videos of this brand make and model versus this brand make and model if you have this type of back pain and if you like to sleep in this position, right? So the learning curve uh, becomes becomes a lot easier to deal with. You can figure out all this stuff just sitting on your couch, on your phone or with a computer, and then you can order the mattress online. Someone brings it to your door, uh, and then you have 90 days to try it out. Or, you know, if you don't want it, you want to return it, they'll just come and get it, and it costs nothing to do that. So all of a sudden, these things that, that we all collectively agreed that the internet would, would never take over, it did. So mattress retail, that's another one. Cars. Car vending machines are a legitimate thing. You can do all the research you want on any car that you want. You can find one with the... the you know, exact year, make, model, mileage, everything that you want. You can buy that car and have it brought to your home without getting up off of your couch. And 10 years ago, five years ago, very, very many of us probably would have said that that will never happen. But repeatedly, it keeps happening. It keeps happening over and over and over. So in-person retail just continually falls victim to the internet. And this just happens over and over. And I, I fail to see why music specifically is going to be excluded from that. And I know that the go-to argument here would be, but instruments are different. You've got to play it in person. You've got to touch the wood. You've got to hear the tone. You've got to, you know, really hear the cymbal and wake it up. I don't think that's going to hold up for very long. I really don't. Um, a great example of a company who has, you know, really thought this through um, is Memphis Drum Shop, which is you know, uh, mysymbol.com, Memphis Drum Shop and mysymbol.com are one and the same. And all of the mysymbol.com videos are filmed within Memphis Drum Shop. They have a studio in the back there. I've done that gig a couple times. Um, and of course, it's the idea that you're still able to shop online, but now you're picking out the individual symbol, not just one that was plucked off of a warehouse shelf somewhere. Because when you get into, like, let's say, My Minel Byzance, for example, there are subtle differences between each individual symbol, even if they're all the same size and you know make or the same model of symbol, there are differences between them. So it is helpful to be able to hear the exact one that you're getting, but this can be done with the internet too. MySymbol.com has been doing it for like a decade now. So there are definitely some workarounds there where I, I think um, this concept that you have to try something in person and touch it before you would ever spend your money on it, you know, that wasn't true for cars until it was, and it wasn't true for mattresses until it was, and you know maybe for you that's not how it works for instruments right now, but it's coming, it's coming. I think we would all be shocked at the consumer's willingness to buy instruments that they've never actually played or seen in person before. Um, you know, another really good example was my signature snare drum, right? I mean, that was a, it's a really expensive drum that very few people have ever seen. You can't go see it in a store. And we sold, I think it was 12 of them in 36 hours. That's a whole lot of people investing in an instrument that they never touched before. Um, and it's the power of the internet in a lot of ways, or at least that should serve as some evidence that uh, people really don't need to go to the music store 
to to find out exactly what they love, especially not when shipping gets faster and free, uh, return policies become a lot more generous, and the ability to learn about the product through mediums like YouTube or Facebook or Instagram, you know, when that gets facilitated, all of a sudden, like, why would I go to the store, right? So, you know, the future of music retail, I do have one thought about this, and I would love to know what you guys think in the comments about this. Um, I would like to see something along the lines of a showroom model happen to the music industry. So let me give you an example. Um, let's take Minel for for example. I don't think there will ever be a Minel retail retail store. You know, they use um, distributors and and sales hubs to sell their gear, right? So they make. Um, large sales to Guitar Center, to Sam Ash, to music retailers, to drum shops as well. Uh, and then they sell their symbols for them at a marked up price. So everybody along the chain can make a little bit of money. But I wonder if there aren't many of those retailers around. Let's just take Orlando for an example. Let's say that the Guitar Center and the Sam Ash here, that they all go away. There is no music retail in this entire city, which in my eyes is definitely a possibility in the next five, six years, if not less than that. So if that happens, I wonder, would it be in Minel's best interest to have a showroom storefront, right? So what I mean by that is like, like you get a storefront building, you could run a drum shop out of here, but that's not what they do. They're not actually selling inventory out of the store. That's not how it works at all. What they have is one symbol for they have one version, one copy of every single symbol that they make in the store. So there's three to 400 individual symbols in the store. Every size, make, model, and variation that you could ever imagine is there. And you only need one or two people to run that entire store because all this is is a showroom. You come here, you check out the product, you hear it, you see what you like, and then they can facilitate an order. They can place the order for you, or maybe you just place it on your phone later that night, right? Doesn't really matter to them. It's not a point of sale, the store. It's merely a showroom. So overhead goes way, way, way down because the only bill here from like the perspective of Minel, just in this thought experiment, would be employing the couple people who are very knowledgeable staff members inside of the store, and then like, the rent and utilities at the store itself, but that's it, that's it, right? And, and so I wonder, could individual companies do this, right? Could there just be merely, you know, maybe Sweetwater would do this, sorry, I'm just talking out loud now, but like a Sweetwater showroom that's in different cities where it's like a Sam Ash or a Guitar Center, but you actually purchasing something in the store is not necessarily what they're going for. There is no stock room uh, full of everything. It's all shipped. It's all based on the internet. Um, it's just a matter of getting that stuff in your hands, you know, after you've you've touched it. But this idea of a showroom model is very interesting to me. And what got me thinking about this was in downtown Orlando several years ago. Um, What's that car company? I want to say it's Alpha, Alfa Romeo. I think it was them. They, they opened a car dealership downtown. And I mean like, like at the bottom floor of a skyscraper, there's a car dealership. And it's weird because like where do you put the cars, right? Like there's no parking lot here. Like there's parking garages, but these are for the public. And I realized that this car dealership was just a showroom. There are six or seven cars in the showroom and that's it. That's it. So you can go there. You can have the full experience. Touch the car that you're interested in. Uh, you can probably take some of them out and drive them. And then if you want to place an order for one, come over to this desk and let's talk about what we're going to order you. Because it's not here. Uh, there is no parking lot, right? And so that showroom model to me is very interesting. I, I think when we when we think about retail in general shutting down in a variety of different industries, um, I, I do still think that there's value in, in having the option to go put your hands on a piece of gear um, or car, for example. I don't think people will ever want to forfeit that entirely. Um, but, you know, I, I have little sympathy for for the guitar centers and the Sam Ash stores. Sam Ash a bit more because I know they're a family-run run business. Um, but at the same time, you know, the time to pivot online was over a decade ago at this point. Um, you know, depending on, on like foot traffic or I don't know if they're still doing like magazine advertising or mail advertising for people to come into your store. Man, that just seems like that that's a, a lost cause at this point for sure. 
But I'll tell you who I would love to see survive this for sure is um, shops like Bentley's Drum Shop in Fresno, California, Memphis Drum Shop. Um, you know, I, I've been to these places and they're incredible. They're just incredible. Not only is the experience incredible, um, but the amount of gear that they have is is insane. It, it makes it makes Guitar Center look like they don't even have a drum department, right? Um, and also, places like that, the legendary like five star drum shops, they are also like borderline museums. I mean, they have so much collectible, incredible vintage gear that's there. Um, so these are where like these these like legendary level drum nerds go to work, you know, and it's a, these are really special places. So it's those kind of places that I have the highest hopes for. I really, really hope that, that of the 10 or 15 or 20 like legendary status drum shops that are in the U S at least, man, I really, really hope that they're able to survive. And if I lived near a place like that, I would gladly spend my money there, um, over a major retailer like, you know, Sweetwater Musician's Friend. Um, but with that said, if, if I'm between giving my money to the massive corporation that is Guitar Center or the massive corporation that is Sweetwater, to be totally honest, I'm giving it to Sweetwater because I think they are better at their job. I think they do a far, far better job of taking care of customers. I don't know if you've ever ordered anything from Sweetwater, but it's it's pretty amazing. I mean, their process is so streamlined. The website is excellent. Uh, their customer service is just absurd. This is not a sales pitch for Sweetwater, but... If you've ever tried ordering from them versus ordering from Guitar Center, it's a really, really big difference in the customer experience. And the only type of place that would get my money before Sweetwater or Musician's Friend or one of those big online retailers would be like a legendary mom and pop drum shop. Yes, I'd rather go there uh, to support someone local in my community, but we don't have those in my city. So uh, yeah, this is a lot of stuff to think about, man. It's... um. It's a very tricky conversation, and I don't want to pretend that my expertise lies in music retail. I've got a background certainly in music business, but it's a little more in the education sector, so I'm not like super deep into the retail world necessarily. But I know a good bit about this, man, and to be honest, my answer is within five to ten years, I don't believe that there will be many music retail stores left at all. The ones that I hope survive are the legendary shops for sure. So tricky conversation, a whole lot of directions we could go, but if you guys have any thoughts about this, please drop them in the comments. I would uh, I would love to hear what you guys think. Next question is from Jamal. He asks, uh, hey Adam, I really like your new practice session videos from when you were getting ready for the minor recordings. However, you said the songs were about 90% written for those videos. So I was wondering, what these songs sounded like at the very beginning of the writing process. How do you approach writing drum parts to a song from day one? So that's a great question, man. And yeah, the um, those practice videos, yeah, the songs were about 90% written. So if you watch any of them, I think only Wet Texan is out right now. Um, it was done maybe two weeks to a month before I went and did the final recording. So the songs were pretty dialed in, structures were all done. Uh, it was just a matter of working out fills and transitions and small things like that. But you're asking, what did the songs look like the first day that I got the track? And let me tell you exactly the setup here. Um, these, all three of those tracks that I did for my last trip to Nashville to record for Minel, all three of those songs were sent to me completed. So I had no I had no part in the writing process of the actual song. I wrote all of the drums, but they weren't written while the song was being written. I was handed a complete drumless song, and then I had to write parts against it. So that's sort of how I was starting. So let me take you through what day one would look like on that. You definitely, for me, I always begin with just structure. First things first, I have to be able to survive this song. So I will play the most generically appropriate thing that I can play for that entire song. That means if I can play a basic rock beat and it sounds okay, it's kind of sort of fits, then I'm playing a basic rock beat. If it requires that I go into halftime, then I go into a halftime basic rock beat. If a fill is supposed to go here, I do the easiest one that comes to mind for that particular section. I'm not trying to be creative initially. I'm just trying to survive the song and ultimately just keep time um, in the song while adhering to the structure. And more than anything, what you're really doing is you're building the map of the song in your own mind. So you know that this section is four bars, this section is eight bars, this section is 16 bars. And as you get that structure down, like you get the map that is the song, then you start layering on um, some of the other textures. So another huge texture, for example, would be, would be dynamics. 
does the volume change from section to section? Now, I'm not talking about fills yet. I'm not talking about the ghost notes within a particular groove. We're not there yet. More so, like if there was a volume rating of like one through 10 for each section, try to give each section a rating. So I kind of know what to do with my volume level as different sections of the song pass. So that would be one layer. If you wanted to do another layer, maybe you would you would start working on fills. So you pick, you know, two or three sections of the song where you go, you know what, right in this section, I'm really feeling this kind of fill. Maybe it's just single strokes down the toms, easy sort of fill. So you would begin to include that every time you go through the song, right? So now you're sort of beginning to build and stack different things on top of the song. So you start with your map, then maybe you do dynamics. So you have your, your map of what section happens when, uh, then we start controlling the volume as we move through the song. And then we start picking out little moments where each time this happens, we go from the A section to the B section. I know that I'm gonna do this fill. So we start including that in these passes as we go through the song over and over, we start stacking things up and building these layers. And ultimately, the layers become more complex as you repeat this song hundreds of times, right? And so part of your job, I think, is to pay attention as you're building those layers. To see the song, or rather to hear the song, with fresh eyes as often as you can. And that's it's oftentimes impossible to do in one day, you know, but like revisiting the song the next day and saying, okay, so yesterday I picked uh, this fill, this fill, this fill, and that's kind of how I've been playing it. Do I like this? Does this sound good to me still? Or are there tweaks that I could make? What am I hearing that that I might like a little bit better? Um, have I tried, oh, like, ooh, should I try triplet subdivisions instead of 30 second note subdivisions? Does that work? So it's a lot of like toying around with the concepts that you're using um, as you're doing the writing. But again, you're just making these layers more complex as you go. And as you spend one, two, three, four months on one particular song, the layers of complexity get thick, right? Like there ends up being a whole lot of things that you have memorized that you do inside of there. But for me, that's kind of what the entire process looks like until I've built up these layers you know, so thick that it ends up being a pretty complex song with a whole lot of really specific moments and things that happen in there, but it definitely doesn't start that way. So, um, you know, I'll give you one, one more example. You know, I said I was using, I would use like a basic rock beat. The most generically appropriate thing you could get away with is what you start doing. Um, and so one of those layers of complexity that you could add would be like toying around with the kick drums. So for the chorus, you're playing a basic rock beat to start with, but what happens if we move the backbeat? Um, instead of on the four, it's on the E of, yeah, the E of four. You move it one sixteenth note forward. Okay, try that out. Do you like it? Eh, maybe, maybe. It's permutate, try another snare. And so you experiment with a lot of these different variables until you find one that sits really well. And that's a new layer on top of the song. And so we're gonna start doing that every time now. And these just stack up. You could do this with kick drums, you could do it with ghost notes, you could do it with particular cymbal accents and crashes. I mean, everything, everything, right? But Hopefully that answer makes sense, man. Start really, really simple. Start with your map, your timeline. Make sure you can survive the structure and then begin adding uh, those layers of complexity one at a time. So maybe you'd have a whole day for fills, a whole day where you're working on where the kick drums can or can't go, and another day on um, dynamics and volume, just all of the categories, you know? So that's a great question, Jamal. It, it, uh, it's one of those things that's gonna be different from person to person, but I think for the most part, the description that I just gave you is gonna to apply to, to a lot of different people, uh, a majority of people, I think. If you have a different writing process, I would, I would love to know. I don't know what other way there is necessarily to write a song, uh, write drum parts to a song, unless you were to just completely rearrange the order that you're doing all of that stuff. Like, if you like starting with fills first or something, I mean, yeah, I'd like to hear an explanation for that one, but yeah, it's a good question, man. Hopefully that makes sense. Mark C is asking, uh, this is a short one here, but I like this. Mark, Mark C asked, should seasoned drummers ever go back to basics? Why or why not? So I think my short answer would be yes. Seasoned, experienced, even professional drummers sometimes have to go back to basics. But it's not, it's not always that, that simple. I, I do think that you can sometimes go back to basics and waste your time, that, that people might, might do that and it doesn't actually give them very much of a benefit. You know, For example, 
you know, going back and practicing like your standard paradiddles at 50, 60, 70 p.m., if you've been able to do that for 10 or 15 years or 20 plus years, I don't really see the point of that level of repetition. You could certainly go back and focus on amending your technique slightly or crank the speed and really work on your fluidity with that particular rudiment. So there's like, like fixtures within the skill set that you could sort of tweak around. But I think for the most part, a lot of the idea of like going back to basics for a really seasoned drummer, you're going to do it for a very specific reason. And you're asking, you know, why would you do that or why not? So why is, is what I want to focus on. Why would somebody go back to the basics? I think this is something that drum teachers encounter a, a lot, especially if it's not a brand new drummer. If it's someone who's been playing for a few years and then they hit some walls and they're playing and they said, well, I need to go, you know, get a drum teacher, maybe go back to basics. That's so that's that's a huge part of the job of drum teachers is taking people back to the thing they originally learned and saying, well, hey, you didn't quite learn this the right way. You skip some steps or you form some bad habits. And now we're going to have to undo and rearrange a lot of these things that you have going on. Oftentimes, technique is a big one for that, right? People just intuitively figured out what to do with technique. But that that doesn't mean you're anywhere near perfect, right? There's always some corrections to be made in the technique domain. And I think seasoned drummers are not immune from this, right? I mean, if I've been playing drums like going on 20 years now, and it would be really egotistical and, and seemingly foolish for me to say that I have no bad habits, that I learned everything correctly the first time that I learned it. Like, who am I to say that? Like, that's probably not true. You get somebody with a with a higher level technique than me, and they could easily point out some things. Say, hey, how long have you been been doing this with your pinky? Like, oh, well, that's wrong, and you've been doing it for 20 years. Like, we all have things like that. So um, it, it's it's definitely contextual. A lot of it is what your goals are. You know, if you had a goal, let's just say to have single strokes that were like unbelievably fast, you know, you might have to do a deep dive on your technique. Not that there's anything inherently wrong with with your tech, like your wrist technique or your finger technique. But if you want to get to the next level, we're gonna have to be really detail oriented about what exactly you're doing with your fulcrum, with your um, leveraging your fingers. Like you might have to open technique back up again as a seasoned drummer if you had a goal um, that was just a really tall order, right? It's just, it's just a very difficult thing to figure out. So that could be the case for sure. I also think that you can be a specialist in specific things and leave out some of the other basics. So for example, if I were to really just say that I want to learn like Latin jazz, I want to learn Latin jazz. For me, as a professional drummer with almost 20 years of playing experience, I'm going back to basics there because it's relative to to the specific thing that I want to learn, right? So I didn't do any of the basics in Latin jazz. I was never interested in that. And if I became interested in it, by all means, I'm going back to like a novice beginner level. I need the same lesson that you would give to, to a third or a fourth grader who wanted to learn that. I need the exact same lesson. So it's relative to exactly what you're studying and all of that seasoning that you have. You know, it might have been really specific to a specialized thing, right? If you played speed metal for 20 years, well, you're going to need a beginner's 101 lesson for jazz dynamics. You just are. So there are definitely some circumstances where a seasoned professional um, or just let's just say an advanced drummer would have to go back to basics. But I think it's just going to be hyper, hyper personalized. That's for sure. And the last thing I'll say about this concept of you know, advanced drummers going back to basics is that oftentimes you might not be the person who is able to determine whether or not you should do that. It's really hard to be objective about yourself and your own playing, your own skill level, your own strengths and your own weaknesses, which is where a drum teacher comes in. A lot of times it's much easier for someone who is at your skill level or a little bit higher than your skill level to assess your playing and say, hey man, I really think that what might help you here is doing something like this. And I've realized this as I've, you know, again, played drums for almost two decades now. When I see someone who's played drums for six, seven, eight, nine years, I mean, they could still, by all definitions, be like an advanced drummer, right? They could have learned tons of different concepts, patterns, rudiments, um, have a whole arsenal of, of grooves and musical concepts under their belt. But I can now begin to see things in their playing that I remember where I go, oh, you're doing that sort of thing. Like, okay. 
So let's go back a little bit. How long have you been doing that? Like, okay, let's try and tweak this thing a little bit because I see where you're going and I can save you a little bit of time. This is what drum teachers do. This is the job that we signed up for, right? And it's one of the more fun parts about the job. Uh, but, but I would say to anybody who is in that posi- position, you're a seasoned or, or a more upper level intermediate or an advanced drummer. You've got some time under your belt playing this instrument and you're wondering, should I go back to basics, should I ever revisit uh, basic technique or basic rudiments or basic theory? A lot of times you're just not the person to answer that question, but um, another drummer, preferably a drum teacher, someone with an educational background, they can answer it for you. And they could say, hey, if you're gonna revisit the old stuff, here's what would serve you best, here's the thing that I see you could go back and work on a little bit. So yeah, get another set of eyes on it and that uh, that might make things a lot clearer for sure. And we got one more question here from Spencer N. Spencer says, I know you've talked about mental health on your other podcast quite a bit, but I'm hoping you might have a message specific to musicians as it pertains to social media. How much time do you personally spend on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, etc.? Do you ever fall victim to the likes, comments, and self-esteem issues that many other artists do? If so, what do you do about it? This is a great question, Spencer. I really like this one. Um, And what he's referring to, my my other podcast is All In With Adam. It's mainly a philosophical slash psychological podcast that's just centered around general self-improvement and a lot of deep introspective thinking might be a good way to describe that podcast. And so I've talked about mental health quite a bit more over there. Link is in the description if you guys want to check, check out All In With Adam. Um, But specific to musicians, yeah, man, there's definitely, you know, that's my whole relationship to social media is music oriented. It always has been. I have never had, you know, aside from All In With Adam, which is a, a relatively new like other project that I'm doing, you know, I never had a phase where I used Facebook and Instagram and YouTube for like personal stuff. For me, it was always music oriented, which for me is synonymous with saying it's career or business oriented. So I never got sucked into a lot of the the personal stuff um, that people get sucked into on social media. You know, I never had just like, you know, an I'm Adam Instagram where it was just like my food and stuff that I was doing. I never really did that maybe for a very brief period of time, uh, but I never just, I never got into it. It was always Insta Chops or Orlando Drummer. It was always that. So in a way, I feel somewhat removed, like it wasn't always my personality that I was putting up onto the internet. And I have definitely played the game and experienced what it's like to have your self-worth tied in to social media numbers, YouTube views, comments, likes, getting the approval or perhaps the disapproval of you know massive amounts of strangers on the internet. I, I know what it's like to have your day impacted uh, or your emotional state impacted from getting those comments, positive or negative. I've been there and I've definitely felt that before. But there is one element of this that might be, might be very unique to my story um, that makes me feel kind of immune to some of these thoughts and that is that I always felt like I got the early approval from the internet. You know, when I made drum lessons, 10 years back, there was very few people doing that. And so it wasn't difficult to stand out, to get positive attention because you were just, you know, you were, it was like a rare breed of people that were into doing this before there was really that big of a market. No one really knew if there was a market or not. And so it was, it was relatively easy to get like the consensus industry approval for, for the content that I made. So that was nice, and I got I got the shit beat out of me a couple times too from putting out content that was either bad or clipping floor toms or I missed a note here. People will let you know so that they keep you in shape at the same time. All that to say, it this stuff all bothered me a lot more back in the day than it used to. And one of the things you asked is about my current relationship, like how much to these platforms, how much time do I spend on YouTube and on Instagram and on Facebook? My answer is, as close to zero as possible. Instagram specifically was one of the first ones that that I kind of bailed out of. For me, I'm on Instagram, I would say about five minutes per day, five minutes per day. I actually don't have Instagram on my phone, not on here. It was uninstalled over a year ago. Um, It's on this iPad actually, which I don't carry with me everywhere. Who carries an iPad around? That's a weird thing to do. Not that old yet, but (laughs) Um, I have Instagram on this iPad. so. What I will do is open once a day, I will make an Instagram post and then I'll go through comments and I'll try to respond to anyone that, you know, um, that needs a response. Uh, If I have DMs every once in a while, I'll check them and then I'll post a couple of stories 
and then I'm out. I mean, you can see my followers on Instagram. I follow, um, who is it? I mean, my wife, my other podcast. We got an Instagram for the farm that we have here. And uh, I think I follow like UFC because I, you know, like get, getting the schedule updates when the fights happen. It's easy to open my iPad and check that. But I mean, yeah, I am by all means unplugged from that entire app. I hate saying this with such a definitive statement. It, it, it Being super definitive about this, it might not be the right way to say it. But I think for the most part, a large portion of what these social media platforms are could be described as poisonous, you know, like it is not good for you to spend three, four, five, six hours a day on social media platforms. I, I genuinely believe that, that it is harmful to your psyche. It's harmful to your being to spend your time that way. And of course, that's not to degrade all of the amazing things that social media can do. I build a business on social media, I owe a huge debt of gratitude to Instagram specifically, to YouTube specifically, and I can't even begin to compile a list of all of the things that I have learned uh, from apps like YouTube specifically. But when I think of how 90 plus percent of the user base on those platforms chooses to engage with the platform, most of the time, they're not participating in what I would describe something that, that's like a free choice, right? You're being fed things that are designed to entertain you, to capture your attention, and to keep your eyes on the screen for as long as possible. So for me, my relationship to YouTube, I don't subscribe to anyone. I don't subscribe to my favorite YouTubers. They'll never get a subscription from me. I will type their name in every single time that I wanna watch one of their videos. I will click on their page, I will go to new videos, and I will click the video. I would rather spend the 10 seconds opening YouTube and treating it like a tool that I have full control over instead of handing the reins over to the platform itself and saying, you show me what I want to watch. To me, that's the line that I have to draw. Instagram is the same way. I'll never go to the explore page and just see what's on here. No, if there's an Instagram that I know I like, a person that I know I, I like their content, I'm typing their name in, I'm clicking their page, and then I'm interacting at my own discretion. I choose when and how much I interact with these platforms, not the other way around. And so for me, this has been a really healthy line to draw on all of the social media platforms. I keep control of my relationship to this at all times, and that means keeping my feeds empty. Um, on Facebook, I have unfollowed every single one of my friends on Facebook. My feed says cannot load every time I open it up. It shows me nothing because I've said to Facebook, I'm interested in nothing and I don't want you to show me anything. If I'm going to use the tool that is Facebook, I'm gonna use it exactly like a tool. I have to choose to open this up and type in what I'm looking for. And is that inconvenient? Marginally inconvenient sometimes, but what I get from that is Ultimately, like the app doesn't even function how it's designed to. Like you open the app and you're gonna spend 15 seconds on Facebook when your newsfeed is empty. Cause you realize like, oh, it's really nothing I want to see so bad that I'm gonna type it in. But all of a sudden, if Facebook was like, hey, remember three weeks ago when you watched a video of like a, like a car getting picked up by a tornado? Here's another one of a car getting picked up by a tsunami. And you're like, oh, that's kind of crazy. And then four hours go by, right? To me, the line you have to draw there is to say, you're not to Facebook to say, you're not allowed to show me things. I'll tell you what I want to see when I want to see it. And man, this has totally reshaped and redefined my relationship to these social media platforms. So on all of them, it's the same thing. Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, all the same thing. They show me nothing. I choose to go to go spend my time and attention uh, where I see it appropriate, not how Facebook, Instagram, and uh, and YouTube does. So that's my personal relationship to these platforms, and it has been super, super helpful for me, man. I would recommend anybody trying that out. It just sort of removes you from the entire game that people seem to be playing, and I think it's it's ultimately to your benefit um, to do that. So. You know, take it or leave it. I think. Uh, I think depending on who you ask, some people might say they're totally unbothered by <clears throat> by playing the game that is social media and really allowing their culture and their life and their belief systems and everything to be shaped uh, by social media. But I'm just a fan of maintaining a little bit more control over your mental health, your mental stability, and really just you know you dictate to the world how you're how you're going to spend this time, the content that you're going to going to consume. That should all be within your control at all times. And so, 
yeah, that's my recommendation. You know, t- take the reins back if you if you can. If that's within your capacity to do, I think uh, I think it's the right way to do it. So that's all I have for you today, guys. I thought these questions were sick. I hope you guys agree. There's only five questions, I think, but we've been going for a little while. So I think we're going to call it there. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode. This has been episode 23 of the Orlando Drummer Podcast, and I will see you guys next week. Thanks. Bye.